Bonjour, good afternoon. My name is Daniel Bellan. I'm the director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here uh, today with you for a very special event. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg nations. It is important to us at MISC to recognize the significance of the land on which we work, study, and live, and to acknowledge the complex web of relationships of which we are a part. We encourage you uh, to uh, seek out more spaces for learning and understanding the history of these territories. The McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, which is known as MISC, uh, is the Centre for Canadian, Quebec and Indigenous uh, Studies programs at McGill University. MISC supports a multidisciplinary approach uh, to the study of Canada by bringing together students, researchers and practitioners to discuss important issues about the country's past, present and future. In addition to our academic programs, MISC also hosts public events such as uh, this uh, wonderful Mallory lecture that we'll have uh, just now. And, and these uh, events, these public events, are on a really broad range of uh, topics. As you can see, if you look at our schedule uh, for the fall or even what we'll have next semester, uh, uh, it's, it's broad and it's uh, inclusive. Um, if you um, want to know more about our institute, you can go to mcgill.ca slash misc, M-I-S-C. Today we are pleased to welcome, uh, to welcome you to the fall 2023 Mallory Lecture. Uh, I would like to take a minute to thank the Mallory family, um, whose support enriches the study of Canada at McGill and makes possible these annual lectures. This is really a tradition here at McGill and at MISC, and we are really happy to, to hold uh, this lecture on a yearly basis. J.R. Mallory was a professor of political science. He was born in 1916 uh, in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, and was educated at uh, New Brunswick, uh, Dalhousie, and Edinburgh. Uh, his career took him to Saskatchewan, Toronto, Brandon, and McGill, uh, where he served for 45 years uh, as a faculty member here at McGill, and he had a very strong impact on this university. Uh, he was uh, chair of the economics and political science departments for 10 years, and after retiring in 1982, he was appointed professor emeritus and continued to teach for another 10 years. Uh, professor Mallory passed away in 2003. Uh, the endowment for the J.R. Mallory uh, Lecture in Canadian Studies was established in January 1995. The lecture has featured such renowned speakers as Bob Ray, Andrew Coyne, Alain Dubuc, Tom Kent, John Gomery, Chantal Hébert, Andrew Cohen, uh, no, uh, and uh, Elizabeth May, Thomas Mulcair, and, and others. Uh, so, of course, today we have another great speaker uh, for this 2023 uh, Mallory Lecture. Uh, professor Ka Catherine Harrison uh, is Professor of Political Science uh, and Brenda and David McLean Chair of Canyon Studies at the University of British Columbia. Uh, and she received a, a BA and a MA degrees, oh no, it's really not MA, it's a bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical engineering, huh? mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, before completing her PhD in political science. Professor Harrison has uh, worked uh, in the oil industry and as a policy analyst for both Environment Canada and uh, the United States Congress. So she has a lot of concrete policy experience as well as her distinguished uh, uh, academic record. She has served as Senior Associate Dean and Acting Dean at uh, the UBC Faculty of Arts. Uh, she has published widely on Canadian and US environmental policy. She's um, Chair of the Expert Advisory Panel on Climate Mitigation of the Canadian Climate Institute and a member of, the Brit of British Columbia's Climate Solutions Council. So uh, she uh, is involved very broadly uh, in this topic. She's one of the leading experts of uh, environmental policy in Canada. And the topic she's talking about today, she's 
extremely knowledgeable about. She's written the reference, the, the, the most influential book on that topic, and she has been working on this for a long time. And I'm really, really glad to have her today because she's also a friend and a wonderful person. Uh, and uh, today she will discuss federalism and the climate crisis, asking whether climate action and intergovernmental harmony can coexist, which is, as you know, if you're following the debate on uh, uh, the carbon tax, uh, and heating oil, among other things. It's a pretty contentious issue as we speak today. Uh, so very, very timely topic. So Catherine, we are really glad to have you today, and it's all yours. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that kind introduction, and I'm delighted to be here um, with some folks that uh, I've known for a long time and some former students, among others. Um, Danielle has already introduced the, um, the title of my talk, and I will give you the abstract and save you, you know, half an hour or 35 minutes if you like. No is my answer, but I will then, you know, going to explain why I make that case. Now, I chose the term climate crisis intentionally. Um, as academics, we sometimes try to avoid loaded sounding words, but we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, so these images on the screen in the top left is the BC coroner's report on the heat dome in June 2020, where about 600 British Columbians died in a few days, most of them alone in their homes waiting for ambulances that never came. Um, the bottom left is what's left of the town of Lytton, uh, indigenous community that broke Canada's heat records every day in a row of that heat dome. In the final day, the temperature reached 49.6, which is, for reference, warmer than the guidance for what you should set your hot water heater at to avoid scalding. Um, and then the next day, the whole town burned to the ground. The upper right, that year when the Fraser Valley saw massive flooding after what um, climate scientists call an atmospheric river and cut the lower mainland, the Canada's third, third largest municipal area, off from the rest of Canada by roads um, for a couple weeks. And then finally, the summer of 2023 where it seems all of Canada has been on fire and tens of millions of people have been breathing unhealthy air as a result. So um, this is a crisis and one that requires urgent attention from governments. The one thing I would want to leave you with before leaving this slide is we often hear this described as the new normal. Um, but it's not because things are going to keep getting worse the planet will keep getting warmer, these uh, events will become more frequent and more serious until Canada and the rest of the world gets to net zero. How bad things get will be determined by how quickly we get there. So this is not the new normal, this is the beginning. Uh, as Daniel said, this is a topic I've been working on for a long time, but not the whole time. So I wrote my doctoral dissertation on federalism and environmental policy, defended it 30 years ago. Um, and then I went on and did other things. I did publish it as a book called Passing the Buck, and then I came back to it in the last few years. And so giving a lecture like this kind of prompts one to reflect on uh, a topic over a long time. And I can assure you that I know from the minuscule royalty checks that I received that I am not assuming any of you have read this book. So I'm going to tell you what I think it said. I haven't reread it, reread it myself in a while. Um, three or four points. The first is that we tend to think everyone's in favor of environmental protection, so of course this should be easy to do, but in fact it's really tough politics. It's tough politics because there's a collective action problem, the average person isn't paying that close of attention, and the people who are paying attention are the industries whose pollution would be regulated who stand to pay a cost, and that has created real political challenges. It's easy to pass sort of aspirational statutes and much harder to implement them by adopting the rules that actually clean up that pollution. 
That has nothing to do with federalism. That's just the nature of the challenge of environmental policy. But layering that on top of Canada's federation with a particular division of powers does have implications for federal provincial relations. And in fact, what we saw over a period of decades was a dynamic where the federal government could just pass the buck to the provinces. This is really provincial responsibility, natural resources, property and civil rights, and avoided taking responsibility. The provinces did not pass the buck back less because they really wanted to be the ones to protect the environment and more because they were protecting local industries from the potential of overzealous federal regulators and also protecting their authority to stimulate their economies through development of crown resources that they control and protect their revenues from those crown resources. So we had a nice symbiotic relationship, the feds passing the buck to the provinces, the provinces jealously guarding their authority. There were exceptions during periods when the public's attention did turn to the environment, 1969, 1989, 2007, and most recently 2019. During those periods, both orders of governments tend to get all excited about protecting the environment. More often, they fight then. But in the past, what we have seen is harmony restored because the feds back off. They say they're going to do all these things. And then when you know voters stop paying attention, they kind of leave it to the provinces. So that was the basic argument. Um, they get along best when they're trying the least to protect the environment. How does that work? Has that traveled over 30 years when we look at climate change, which is quite a new kind of environmental challenge? Environmental protection is still tough politics and arguably even tougher politics because now we're not only concerned about um, regulating industrial sources, but also regulating regular Canadians' use of fossil fuels to um, move their cars around, to heat their homes, and so on. Um, this is uh, from our world in data, fantastic source of all kinds of data, including environmental data. This is comparing trends in per capita CO2 emissions from burning fossil fuels and from um, other industrial sources of multiple countries. Uh, probably pretty tiny print for you, but on the right, what you can see is that Canada and the US are very close together at the top. There are actually countries higher up. Qatar has per capita emissions of just under 50 tons per person. But among the big emitters, Canada, the US, Australia are, are at the top in per capita emissions. And what that means is two things. We have a really long way to go to get to net zero, and we have a lot of actors who have big economic stakes in those emissions. This figure is comparing who some of those actors are. This is a figure that was um, prepared by Andrew Leach. Some of you who went to his talk recently on campus might have even seen this one. I had the, have the privilege of being a co-author of, of Andrew's and uh, um, we have used some of these figures. So you're gonna see some Andrew slides and then some that I made that are really gonna look sad. By comparison, um, this is comparing the emissions from 1990 to 2020 in different sectors. A couple takeaways here. One of them is that although electricity emissions were going up for a time, they've actually gone down pretty steeply. We're on the right track with reducing um, emissions from electricity generation. But two of these don't look like the others. The oil and gas industry, this is the emissions just from getting the stuff out of the ground that doesn't include actually burning the emissions. It, is, it has doubled, those emissions have doubled from 1990 to 2020 and um, are now the largest single sector, 28% of Canada's emissions. The second largest sector also growing emissions is transportation, which is 22% of emissions. So we've got two economically and politically significant sectors oil and gas, and motor vehicle manufacturing that have been going in the wrong direction. 
but it's not just industry in this case. That's kind of how we used to think about environmental problems and how many folks still do. The challenge with climate change is that those large industrial emitters account for less than half of Canada's emissions, and the rest are individual vehicles, heating our homes, waste management, farms, and so on. And Canada's emissions are pretty high there too. This is a slide comparing fleet average CO2 emissions per kilometer traveled in different countries. And Canada, we're number one. And that's not good in this context. We drive the most gas guzzling vehicles in the world. Um, we also live in relatively large houses, which we tend to heat primarily with fossil gas, and we commute from those houses to work in those vehicles. So the average Canadian has quite a large car um, carbon footprint and is pretty happy with that life. I mentioned already um, trends in public attention to the environment. This is uh, data from Environics asking an open-ended question, what's the most important problem facing Canada today? So people only get to pick one. Um, and this is data from 2002 to 2020. There are many other lines I've focused on, just two of them. And you can see the green line is environment and climate, everything environment related. Um, two peaks, the peak in 20. 2007 to early 2008 and 2019. And both of those peaks, the environment was number one. But as with previous peaks, other things replaced it very quickly. That surge in the blue line in 2008 is the global financial crisis. And um, the 2019 one, if you look very carefully, there's a dot at about 40% on the right. Um, that's COVID. So COVID wiped out. You know, the kids were marching in the streets in 2019, and then COVID happened and really knocked the wind out of the sails. Um, just for um, historical reference, the point in 2008 where the green line's going down and the blue line's just starting to take off, where they crossed is when British Columbia announced the carbon tax. The point where the green line hits rock bottom at the end of 2008 and the green line hits the peak is when Stéphane Dion um, led a national campaign calling for a federal carbon tax and um, crashed and burned. Um, okay, so 30 years later, Revisiting those arguments, absolutely, climate change is even tougher politics than um, environmental policy used to be. And what about the sort of federalism passing the buck aspects? And there, I think the argument traveled really well till 2015, and then it fails terribly. And I will sort of walk through illustrating that using carbon pricing, carbon tax, as an example. But first, I want to give you some more data and some nifty um, Andrew Leach slides. These are the emissions by province. This is not per capita. This is total emissions. And you can see that the largest share of emissions um, in Canada is from the province of Alberta at 38% of emissions, Ontario is second with 22% of emissions. Note also the difference in the trends. Alberta, uh, Ontario emissions went up and then came down. That's Ontario shutting all of its coal-fired electricity generation in the early 2000s. In contrast, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and to a lesser extent, British Columbia have seen growth in emissions um, primarily from production of oil and gas. This slide is a different take on that. This time it is per capita emissions, emissions per person. And on this one, I want to focus a little more on those different colored lines. Um, two of these are not like the others. Uh, the, the gap between Alberta and Saskatchewan at over 60 tons per person per year, and Quebec at about 10, is larger than the gap in per capita emissions between any two countries in the world. So we really have very different um, economies and polities within this federation. 
The emissions from transportation, waste, buildings, pretty much the same across the provinces per capita, with the exception of the territories where you know, they're relying on air travel a lot more. But there are also quite pronounced differences. You can see that very top dark section in Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. That's agricultural emissions, which are much greater share in those provinces. Um, the orange, the really big orange chunks, um, that is production of oil and gas. Um, the, um, and electricity generation, which is kind of the violet, I guess I would call it. It's a pretty big one in Alberta and Saskatchewan um, and in Atlantic Canada. But emissions from electricity generation are virtually non-existent in British Columbia, um, Quebec, Manitoba. The differences between these provinces as of 1990 is largely just geography. Who's got rushing rivers? Who's got fossil fuels under the ground? After 1990, I would say it's at least partly due to choices, conscious choices that were made by governments to either increase those emissions or not. See, I warned you that my, my figures are really not that great. Um, this one is not emissions. It is com this is comparing the share of provincial GDP that comes from fossil fuel production. So it includes coal, oil, and gas. And you can see that it's not just Alberta and Saskatchewan. In fact, as a share of provincial GDP, the oil and gas industry accounts for a comparable share of GDP in Newfoundland and Labrador, as in Alberta. And we also see that it's not insignificant in British Columbia, which has um, accounts for a third of Canada's gas production and uh, is hoping to account for more. Um, most of this production is exported, the oil, the gas, and the coal. And that means Canada is not actually responsible for the emissions when this gets burned. We're only responsible for the emissions in getting the stuff out of the ground and, and to the coast. Um, the reason I've included it is because this says something about the economic risks for Canada. Because when the rest of the world is trying to reduce their emissions, the risk is that the market for our exports is going to dry up. And Canada is especially vulnerable in that regard because in the case of oil, the product we, you know, the bitumen that we're exporting is quite low quality and is quite costly to produce. In the case of liquefied natural gas, we're behind. We're still building greenfield plants when others are up and running. So those, the risk to Canada's economy is greater than most other economies when global climate action is occurring, but it is not evenly distributed across the country. Some provinces are especially vulnerable to global climate action. This, uh, this is looking, drilling down in public opinion, looking at um, public attitudes to climate change. This is work done by Eric LaChapelle, Matto Mildenberger, and co-authors. Um, Canadians tend to be pretty proud that a very high percent of us say that global warming is real. 83% nationally, 70 to close to 90% is the range across the provinces. This slide, it's, it's the same color scheme. Um, everything just slides down because it's asking a slightly different question and that is, do you think the Earth is getting warmer partly or mostly because of human activity? That's actually a pretty low bar question. Scientists would all agree that it's virtually all because of human activity. So we're just asking, do you think even we had anything to do with this? The numbers go down significantly to the low 60s nationally, but those two blue provinces, Alberta and Saskatchewan, are below 50%. Noteworthy that the Conservative Party is also, this as of 2021, below 50%. It was at 42% on this question, about half of where NDP and Liberal voters were. Um, so what's my point with all these graphs? Uh, the, the short point would be these are very different economies within Canada 
They are very different polities within Canada, um, but we cannot meet our emissions targets unless we see particularly large emissions reductions from those oil and gas producing provinces because Alberta and Saskatchewan alone account for half of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, let's talk about carbon pricing. <laughs> um, three periods. Um, first one, you know, passing the buck works pretty well. Uh, this is the period of the joint decision trap where um, Canadian, federal, and provincial and territorial environment ministers meet at least once a year. And the norm has been for many decades to make decisions by consensus. Uh, in, after that 1989 wave of public attention to the environment, the Mulroney government proposed a green plan. And when they were developing the green plan, one of the ideas that they floated was to have a carbon tax, and it was taken off the table right away in response to opposition from Alberta. Um, the mid-90s, the Liberal Federal Environment Minister, Sheila Copps, attended these uh, Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment meetings and said it became clear that the rule of consensus in the environmental agenda would mean moving to the lowest common denominator. There was no way that Alberta would agree to any reduction in fossil fuel emissions. And in fact, not, so not only did we see variation in the ambition of provincial climate policy during this period, we saw provincial governments in the venue of the Canadian Council of Ministers of the Environment blocking consensus on national level action. So there was a national climate change process, it was called to develop a plan for how Canada would meet its Kyoto Protocol target that was rather inauspicious inauspiciously co-chaired by the federal government and Alberta. And they never got to agreement. They talked and everybody flew around the country for four and a half years and they never got agreement. The federal government released its own plan. The provinces were all up in arms and they never implemented it. Um, Alberta and I think also Saskatchewan in 2007 or eight um, vetoed or blocked a um, national emissions trading scheme. But it wasn't just the oil and gas industry because at various points, the province of Alberta also blocked development of stricter tailpipe standards for motor vehicles because that was the lifeblood of, blood of their province manufacturing. So during this period, we saw lots of announcement of targets and aspirational plans, and none of them were implemented in a meaningful way, and Canada's emissions just went steadily up. Period two, laboratories of democracy. Um, this phrase refers to the idea that in a decentralized federation, you will have these state or provincial governments, they understand the nature of the problems that they face, they understand the needs and the desires of the community that they're closer to, they can develop tailored solutions, and in so doing, they will innovate, and there will be an opportunity for those innovations to diffuse. They'll learn from each other over time. What we, in fact, saw during this period, and, and to their credit, some provinces were innovating in a vacuum of federal action, um, but we didn't see diffusion. So the first was British Columbia's adoption of a revenue neutral carbon tax in 2008. At the time, uh, Jeffrey Simpson was Canada's national political columnist at the Globe and Mail, and he said, BC is going to be to climate policy in Canada as Saskatchewan was to Medicare. And uh, within a year, he wrote a mea culpa. It did not happen. Um, Quebec also innovated in collaboration with California in an emissions trading scheme that extended coverage for the first time in emissions trading to transportation fuels and home heating fuels. Um, interestingly, before that happened in the late 2000s, um, British Columbia, Manitoba, and Ontario had all committed to join that as well, and seven US states, when it became clear that there would not be a backup emissions trading scheme in either the US or Canada, 
all of those other provinces and states withdrew, except Ontario, which briefly joined the emissions trading scheme in 2018 and withdrew in 2019. Alberta is an interesting special case because Alberta did adopt carbon pricing at two moments. In 2007, um, the Alberta government established the specified gas emitters regulation, a kind of hybrid carbon price for very large oil sands produ um, producers. And their interest in doing so at the time was to preempt federal government involvement and the policy was actually quite weak. Um, in 2015, the Alberta Climate Leadership Plan, I think, had um, broad motives. The Notley government was serious about doing more on climate change, but the choice of a fixed carbon price and the extension of that to households was a particular policy de design that protected Alberta's economy and especially the oil and gas industry. The oil and gas industry was perfectly happy with, perfectly happy with um, that, that policy. So innovations, but they did not diffuse and um, the emissions did not go down. In fact, um, those reductions in Al Ontario that we saw in that um, previous slide were undone um, many times over by emissions growth in the provinces that did not follow Ontario's lead. And then things changed in 2015 in a pretty big way. So I've got like Justin Trudeau putting on his boxing gloves at this point. In 2015, in the federal election, the Liberals kind of signaled what they were going to do, but I didn't take it that seriously. They said there would be a carbon price, but they didn't say what the price would be. They said they would do it in collaboration with the provinces. They didn't say what they'd do if the provinces didn't want to play along. And the critical moment was in the fall of 2016 when the Prime Minister stood up in the House of Commons and announced what we now call the federal backstop, which is basically these are the conditions in carbon pricing that we are looking to the provinces to meet. If they don't do it, we will. The Prime Minister announced this while federal and provincial environment ministers were meeting and several of them, and there was outrage and several left the meeting. Um, not all did. Um, it, the announcement was critical, I think, in getting near consensus on a pan-Canadian framework on climate action. All provinces but Saskatchewan signed on, and it was a rare moment, and it was a short-lived moment. Um, by 2018, there had been changes in government, some second thoughts about the whole carbon pricing agenda, and um, it, by early 2019, the federal government had made clear that it was going to implement carbon, a carbon tax and dividend in five provinces, four of them just before the um, upcoming provincial election, Alberta to follow a couple months later. Um, three provinces fought that, um, challenged the constitutionality, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, and even before those cases made it to the Supreme Court, the federal government doubled down in a new climate plan in December 2020, announcing that the carbon backstop, the backstop price, would be increased steadily to $170 per ton in 2030, which is very high by international terms. I remember exactly where I was sitting in my kitchen when I read this, because I nearly fell off my chair. Um, the Supreme Court subsequently upheld the Federal Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act. In 2022, the feds closed some loopholes. Some of them were intentional, I think, to create flexibility. Some of them, I think, they hadn't anticipated the ways provinces would try to get around the rules. And the result is that now the federal carbon tax and dividend applies in eight provinces, BC still has its own carbon tax, Quebec still has emissions trading. And it is still controversial. Um, and this isn't about federalism. We have seen very similar opposition campaigns against carbon pricing and especially carbon taxes in many jurisdictions going back to the, um, the BC Liberals carbon tax in 2008 and they make the same arguments, often misleading ones. They say carbon taxes don't work. There's a whole ton of studies that 
um, show that that's not true. They argue that it is unfair that, um, you know, giving the idea that somebody else has gotten off the hook and you're paying, which is not true. It's also the federal carbon um, price in particular is highly progressive. They don't talk about that. They emphasize the costs and ignore the dividends. Um, and so in research that I've done with Matt Mildenberger, Eric LaChapelle and others, we found that um, Canadians who have voted previously for this Conservative Party greatly overestimate how much they're paying in carbon taxes and significantly underestimate how much money they're getting back. So they are getting misleading messages from the politicians that they trust. So it's not all about federalism, but federalism really has not helped. We have had um, reinforcing of those messages from conservative um, provincial governments, those that challenge the federal carbon pricing, um, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, uh, Ontario. Recently, I don't know, you may all remember the McLean's co um, cover of the, the resistance. It's like, men, middle-aged men in blue suits. Well, recently they were joined by more middle-aged men in blue suits, a picture of the Atlantic premiers calling on the federal government to get rid of carbon pricing. And in this case, it's not just conservatives because they've been joined by the um, liberal premier of Newfoundland. Fighting Ottawa is a tried and true strategy. And if you've got voters in your, um, your province that are upset about something, like the cost of living, this is a good way to blame some other government. I'm going to run out of time, so I will return, if you like, to the oil boilers and the carve out, as it is being called in the question period. I had to look up what they actually look like. That is one. Um, but I do not take it as a given, as many who study carbon taxes do, that the carbon tax is dead. Um, I, I think this is a government that has gone to some lengths to fight this. And I'm gonna try wrap up. Um, there is more to come. The clean electricity regulation is a subject of great contention. The oil and gas emissions cap is still to come and that's gonna be even uglier. Both of the, those will certainly be um, challenged in terms of constitutionality. A real sleeper is the Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act which establishes requirements for the federal environment minister to always have a plan to meet the target. They are required to consult the provinces, but if the provinces don't play along, they're required to find a way to do it. And so that kind of makes it harder as long as that legislation is in place for the feds to withdraw. Can't we all just get along? You know, Canadians want climate action, but they also want, you know, their political leaders to just stop fighting it so unseemly. And the presumption is that we can have both. And we're hearing a lot of that lately, that, you know, they must both be to blame. The Trudeau government's climate you know, carbon pricing plan is divisive, and they're pitting regions against each other. Well, I actually don't think we can have both because there is, a fundamental trade-off in the interests and positions of at least some provinces and um, what's required to take climate action in Canada. Um, the way to get make some of those provinces happy is to weaken climate policy. And they are not proposing substitutes. They are saying, get rid of this. And you know, the, the leader of the opposition is just waving his arms around saying technology. They have not put forward an, an alternative. So there's, there's a lot of uncertainty. What will the Supreme Court uphold in terms of those policies still to come? Um, but I think it's going to get a lot uglier before things get better. And I will leave you with one final slide. This is um, hints at the potential for the interna international climate action to transform the situation, including federal provincial relations in Canada. That the IEA is increasingly anticipating that global demand for oil and gas is going to decline and it'll peak before 2030. Um, if that happens, Canada's economy is in trouble and um, we may see that the, the rest of the world 
um, stops buying our fossil fuels, and if so, the kinds of measures to create the new economy might be the kind of the soil from which um, a future for the Federation can grow. Thank you very much.